Hello, Tim. Hello, great to so see you. So great Shisha. to welcome you back to Shishi University. It's really great to be here. Um, I just love the feeling I get when I come in here. It's just a magical, wonderful, spiritual feeling. How lovely to hear that. And all of us were eagerly waiting to have you back so that we could all witness the unfolding of the second edition of Meet the Drapers being shot right here in Shishi University. So thank you for choosing us as one of the locations. Not only thank you thank me, but I'm thanking you because the winner of last year's Meet the Drapers competition came from the Sri Sri University competition. Uh, absolutely, and we and are I'm so proud. I'm hoping you do it again for me. We are so proud of uh, the, the startup which made it to the final round and became the global winner of the Draper grant. And uh, we are hoping that this time the startups which are pitching are, uh, you know, one of them again makes it to the global uh, final and makes that global prize. So thank you for giving our startups that, uh, you know, opportunity again. So Tim, you are here with us in India uh, after last year, almost after a gap of two years. What do you see different in India? You already have been in India a few days, you were in Delhi, and you have been interacting with entrepreneurs and businesses of India. What, what looks different to you? Uh, it feels as though you're on a ramp of growth. I, it feels as though India is really growing. Things are really starting to take off. Um, infrastructure is improving. Uh, there are there are real um, business and political foci mm -hmm. on um, improving the um, the lives of the people who are so poor. Right. And there's uh, and and in business, I am feeling there are more and more <clears throat> creative entrepreneurs who are doing. Uh, very innovative things, and they're feeling a little bit more freedom. They've mm -hmm. still got a long way to go to get to sort of Silicon Valley levels, but they're feeling a little more freedom to push the edge and mm -hmm. try things. And, uh, and I'm starting to see more trust among the people and more freedom among the people and trust and freedom with a, a clear set of laws. Mm -hmm. uh, is what builds a great economy. And I think you're going to get a great economy here. Um, it's already happening here in India. So I think we're on the ramp. Um, China had that ramp and now it's a plateau because they got a, you know, a bad dictator. Right. But, but uh, I think you have good stability. It's, it feels great. And relative to where you were even two years ago, but 20 years ago, right. when I think I first came to India, uh, India has gone through a major transformation. So I'm seeing a, the blossoming of a great country. Well, that's great to hear. And you're absolutely right. We feel it uh, as, as citizens of the country. We feel it uh, in terms of the growth we are seeing in different industries. And we belonging to the education landscape. We are seeing how the education landscape in India is really... Um, blossoming at a really fantastic pace. Number of private universities, even our uh, you know government institutions like the IITs, IIMs are in many more cities now. So absolutely well said. And we meet today, uh, Tim, in the week of uh, the the results of the U.S. elections. Oh yes. And how do you see that uh, changing uh, things for the world and uh, changing things for Indo-U.S. Partnership and relations. Well, the, I, I, I'm I'm excited about a new chapter, and I think that we've got great hopes for a, a very strong future. Right. And I think the U.S. Um, has lost its way a little bit, and uh, and hopefully it it gets it back. And I think either candidate would have been able to get it back. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we're, um, we've got a, uh, I think we've got a, a really 
huge, interesting opportunity. Uh, and it's going to be a, uh, you know, we almost have a civil war going on yeah. in our country. But uh, I am very cautiously optimistic about this new administration and the opportunity to maybe uh, shed some of those regulations that have made it very difficult for businesses to operate, maybe, um, you know, open up more and, uh, and create more stability around the world. I think those are um, really admirable parts of this new administration. Wonderful. Uh, so I'm hoping for the best. It looks good. It's been very good for Bitcoin. <laughs> and it's been very good for, um, in general, for innovators. They're, they're feeling a little freer. Right. So I think that's going to be helpful. Um, I do feel like um, women feel like they got punched in the gut. Mm. Uh, but I think they are going, I think we're all going to be better off four years from now. So I think that's great. And hopefully we'll, we'll be able to balance that out in, you know, another eight, 10 years, something like that. Right. Yeah. I want to take uh, our attention to uh, the, the, the subject of entrepreneurship while you are here and take some wisdom from you on that. Uh, Tim, since we met last, the Shishi University uh, incubator has grown. We now have about 150 startups Great. with a collective turnover of close to 100 crores. So that's about $12 million. And all of them are in business, making money, making revenue. They've created about uh, 5,000 jobs and are uh, supporting about 20,000 farmers. And uh, about 30, uh, about 25% of these startups are by women. So we are very proud of that. And in this process, we also started one more incubator, which will be a more technology-focused incubator supported by the government of India. So that was a great achievement by our team that the government actually has given us the seed fund for this incubator. And the overall innovation space and the startup space in the country is really, really vibrant and dynamic. In all the investments you are doing, for startups and you're meeting so many startups who are pitching to you. What are some of the industries that are prominent in terms of startup ideas today? What, what have you been seeing around the world? Well, I think the greatest in innovators are doing, um, are going after three or four major industries. Mm -hmm. um, one is the, uh, in healthcare, uh, healthcare is becoming digitized and it's becoming specific to the individual. And mm -hmm. so uh, that's a big change for anybody who's been in big pharma where it's one size fits everybody. Right. Because the digitization says your genetics don't fit the same the way my genetics fit. Right. And, uh, and so I think there are going to be some real interesting, great startups and great revolutions that happen in medicine. Mm -hmm. um, and I know you are pioneering some of those yeah. with the Ayurvedic medicine. Uh, the, the second area um, is in the Bitcoin ecosystem. Mm -hmm. There are, um, uh, there's a gravitational pull toward Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. The innovations are happening all around Bitcoin. And, um, and, you know, we're, it's interesting, the countries that are embracing Bitcoin are starting to thrive and the ones who are pushing it away are getting hurt All right. Uh, because it's coming. Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of people fear the idea of a new kind of a currency, but mm -hmm. it's coming. Right. Um, and, and so lots of innovation around Bitcoin, the blockchain, smart contracts, um, all of these really amazing innovations that are happening. Right. Um, airdrops. There's some, there's some very exciting things happening there. Um, in, uh, in artificial intelligence, it's going to be going after almost every industry. I don't, I don't know of an industry that's not already 
been affected or being affected by artificial intelligence. Yeah. And I think that's really exciting because you're going to see entrepreneurs going, wedging into all these industries by having um, interesting AI applications for them. Right. And I think AI combined with robotics is going to make it so that we have whatever they are, humanoids or vehicles or whatever, right. that are all smart and learning. Yeah. And that's one of the beauties of AI is that now it can learn. Right. Uh, and that's very exciting. And then in space and transportation, I'm seeing real innovation. So that's where Elon Musk has really broken the log jam and allowed people to innovate in a whole bunch of different ways. And so that area, space and transportation, is opening up imaginations to mining asteroids and putting launch pads on the moon and getting to Mars and all these amazing things that are happening. And mm. when you have those great ambitions, a lot of great technologies happen along the way. Right. Um, and then there's always the, the category we call other. Right. <laughs> and other is the category of where none of us expected it, but it ends up being a trillion dollar industry that right. nobody guessed at or whatever. So, right, right. yeah, those are the places I'm looking. Yeah, that's fine. So healthcare, uh, Bitcoin and related, artificial intelligence, robotics and related, and yeah. then space and, space transportation, and transportation. transportation. Yeah. And all of these are pretty cutting edge. Right? Yeah, we tend to be ahead we tend to be maybe five or 10 years ahead of where the press and the consumer would recognize right. what's going on. Right. But uh, it's mostly because that, those are the people I meet. Right. I meet the people who are telling me what the world's going to look like five or 10 years from now. And uh, for all the entrepreneurs and startup founders listening to this interview of yours, Tim, what would you say are, uh, how should a, a startup founder identify that idea for his business? Would you have some two or three or four sort of uh, blueprint sort of, uh, you know, uh, thumb rules to say if this is the, these are the three, four thumb rules it fits, then this is a great idea for a successful business. You know, it's funny because it's not really the idea. Uh -huh. It's um, it's what's inside the heart and soul of the entrepreneur. Okay. And uh, I think that the entrepreneur has to, they have to really enjoy what they're doing. Mm -hmm. They have to have a love for their customer, mm -hmm. total passion for their customer uh, and want to keep iterating. And then, um, and then there are a few things that they can do when, once they start thinking about it. Um, a lot of entrepreneurs are really good engineers and scientists mm. and they're not too good at business, mm -hmm. but they don't know. They just think that's easy. Right. Um, and then there's some that are really good at business, but they don't understand the technology. Often the entrepreneur needs a partner. Right. Um, so sometimes I would give that advice. Right. Sometimes I would not. Mm. Um, what I look for in an entrepreneur is really the um, is is really three things, and all venture capitalists look at these three things: market size, mm -hmm. technology, and the people. Right. So, in dealing with market size, you're, or market, you're you're looking at for a market that's currently um, controlled by an oligopoly or monopoly. Mm -hmm. Uh, and they're providing bad service at a high cost. So the ones that come to mind are the anything big, big pharma, big banking, big insurance, big auto, big government. Right. Um, they're all right for challenge. Uh, they're all right for some new technology coming in there and wedging and making something happen. Right. Um, so that's market. In technology, we're looking for either completely unique technology or technology that's relatively new, that's unique to a market, to a industry, to a new industry. Uh, 
And so there we're looking for a technology that can cre improve the situation for the mm -hmm. customer, lower the cost of providing a service, or improve the cost of providing a service. That's very simple. And then with people, we're looking for people who are meant, meant to do it. Mm. That it's it was meant to be this way. I, mm -hmm. I once had a rocket scientist come to me and say, I'm a rocket scientist, but I'm creating hotels.com. Mm. And I said, what? what? You're a rocket scientist. Make mm. rockets. Mm. Uh, so you've got to have that feeling like this person was meant to do this and always has been. And then there's always the, the would you want to work for them? Mm. Uh, is it somebody you really want to work for? And then is the business something that if hugely successful beyond anybody's wildest dreams, is that a world we all want to live in? Hmm. Uh, so those are the kind of the criteria I'm looking for. Right. And as for entrepreneurs out there, you guys go um, try stuff, take chances, do interesting things. Keep, keep, uh, Keep your mind open and uh, and nothing's impossible. Everything is possible. That's very, very, very insightful, Tim. I want to talk a little bit about failure because, you know, uh, in the startup world, we tend to celebrate successes. Uh, the unicorns make it to, you know, uh, cover pages of business magazines. For those startups, who for what would you advise? What is the threshold till which you push? And then you say, okay, now this is no more. Now it won't work anymore. And let me wind up this idea. And is the time to close? Is there some, again, thumb rule there? Or how would you guide startups? Because a big <laughs> bunch is in this phase where they took off which is easy, the enthusiasm is high, because all the startups I meet, you know, who are very new, I see a different level of enthusiasm because you're still experimenting. Then when you spend a year or two years, you start realizing the real nitty gritties, the rubber hits the road, the challenges are there. And I've seen many people kind of dip in their, even their own confidence in themselves. So w talk to us and our entrepreneurs about that, that when, is the limit and when is it not? A lot of, lot of questions in that question. Uh, if an entrepreneur is doing something they love, mm -hmm. they should just keep doing it. Right. And every great trillion dollar business out there was a pivot. Mm -hmm. So they started with one direction and they moved to another direction. Those weren't entrepreneurs that threw in the towel and gave up. Hmm. Those were entrepreneurs that worked and worked and worked. They were pounding their head against the wall. And one day they said, wait, the customer wants this. Why am I trying to make this? And all of a sudden they pivoted and their businesses took off. Hmm. So, um, that those hardest moments where everybody's feeling like they've got to give up, those are when you're learning the most and when you dig into your subconscious and you take a good nap, you come out of it and you realize that you have the solution and the solution is obvious hmm. and it's where the customer was pointing you all along. Hmm. Uh, there are people who uh, say they want to be entrepreneurs because of the uh, fame and the glory and the money, hmm. um, that is not enough. Right. In fact, there's, a, there's kind of an irony of life. Here's the irony of life. Mm -hmm. That as an entrepreneur, if you're a mercenary, mm -hmm. you make no money. Okay. If you are a missionary, you make money. Wow. You, it's it's a very strange thing. You, if you're after the money, don't become an entrepreneur. Wow. If you're after changing the world, delighting a customer, spreading the word, go for it. Wow. If you're a mercenary, you will not make the money. But if you are a missionary, you 
make the money. Yes. Actually, it's fascinating. You should say this, Tim. Uh, once uh, in some context, uh, we were talking to Gurudev, Shri Shri Ravi Shankar, and uh, we were discussing about, you know, the success of some of our very um, uh, grassroot level projects uh, of Art of Living, where we have been able to rejuvenate rivers, for example, or transform communities. And we were saying that how does this happen that uh, these young volunteers who are not even organized in a in a very development oriented ecosystem, etc., are able to do this kind of transformational impact. And I remember once uh, Gurudev said that it's because they do it not as a profession, but as their mission. Mm. And uh, you said something very similar. Now, there's something you. else you, you hit on there that you may not even notice. Uh -huh. And you said that they were disorganized and just running around. It turns out that a decentralized system uh -huh. outperforms a centralized system every time. Really? Because if you decentralize all those little fingers out there, all those people trying different things have varying levels of success. Right. It's not all perfect. But some of them will rise very high, higher than anybody ever imagined. Whereas it's central, if it's centrally controlled, the the information doesn't disseminate up to that right. that leader. Right. Uh, so if one leader is trying to, like in the case of India, one leader is trying to tell 1.4 billion people how to live their lives. Right. It makes no sense. Right. If you take it family by family though and they just go and they do what do what they feel is the right thing then india grows like crazy yeah yeah and it's just it's a hard thing for a leader to sort of swallow that is often you're better off kind of letting it go you know bill clinton was um president when the internet came right and everyone said, tax the internet, regulate the internet, stop the internet. And he said, let's just see how it goes. Hmm. And, you know, I could say, I could see Sri Sri Ravi Shankar doing the same thing. Right. Let's just see how it goes. And you, and he's so good at decentralization. Absolutely. I mean, Sri Sri has done that. Yes. Um, but if the leader just says, let's see how it goes, then you have... These huge successes in in America, you had these enormous successes mm. that you would never have had if he decided to regulate or tax or control the internet. Right, right. He just said, let's see how it goes. Wow. Um, and that's the way a lot of leaders have taken things like Bitcoin. Yes. They've said, let's see how it goes. And those are the leaders who are going to have the richest countries in the world in the future. Right. And the ones who are trying to regulate and stop and, you know, no, they can't do airdrops. No, they can't use smart contracts. No, they can't. I think they're going to miss out. I think it's going to be very frustrating for them because it's a, it's either, there's always this tension and the tension is, the, the group that likes the way it is and they don't want to see it change. Mm -hmm. And then this, this wave of changes that are coming, yeah. whether they like it or not. And, and it's, a, uh, it's very frustrating for the people who are um, trying to keep it the way it is because it just waves of change. They keep coming and they're accelerating because there are eight billion of us now yeah, yeah. all with access to the same information we can all jump to the internet now Absolutely. we can now we can search ai yes we can do uh, we see so many things so we now have a new platform from which we can all innovate if you you ask me what's happened over the course of my career mm -hmm. the thing that's happened is the communication around the world has become almost a hundred percent full, which means that if something happens in one part of the world, it affects and is spread. The, that information is spread all the way around the world almost instantaneously. And so 
that means that we're all coming, we're all starting from the same point of view. Right. When I was starting in the business, the Silicon Valley and Route 128 in Boston were the real innovative hubs and real centers of innovation. But now, and I, I'd go around the world and I'd talk about the internet. Nobody knew what an internet was. They were way behind. Right. Now, everybody's pretty much caught up. Right. And that was, that's been a beautiful thing. So anyway, thank you to Bill Clinton for that, yeah. um, for just letting it rip. We are really a flat world today in that sense. Absolutely. Isn't it? Yeah. So I know, uh, uh, Tim, you have the crystal ball when you do the Meet the Drapers show. And I'm going to request you to look into that crystal, imaginary mm -hmm. crystal mm -hmm. ball for now. What do you see as the future, say, by 2030 and 2050? Where do you see us being disrupted? And where do you see us being headed as a, as a world human family? So how many years out are we looking? Say 2030, 2050. Okay. So 2050, I'm pretty sure we're all going to be flying around on in jetpacks and drones. Uh -huh. um, I'm pretty sure that we will have cures for almost every disease, mm -hmm. um, probably coming from stem cells. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they will be specific to you. Uh, I think we will have um, long since started to colonize the moon and Mars. Uh -huh. uh, 2050, you might even have a new form of space transportation. Wow. Uh, that allows you to warp drive into wherever. Uh, whether that is capturing energy from space, which space is energy, uh, or it's a way of navigating in space because space moves. Mm -hmm. If you figure out how space is moving, you can actually, like, the shortest distance between two points would not be a straight line. Right. right. Uh, so there are some things that are going to be happening out there in space that's going to be amazing. Um, I think Bitcoin will be generally the global currency, but there will probably be other cryptocurrencies. Mm -hmm. I think governance will be very different. Mm -hmm. um, I think there will be land-based governance, and then there will be everything else. Uh -huh. so Can the, you explain that? Yeah, so land-based is the monopoly they have today. Right. Uh, it will be things like, um, can you build a, a mausoleum next to my house? Okay. Uh, and uh, and how many police do we need around the town? Mm -hmm. And that kind of thing. That's the land base. But the um, the rest of governance is really insurance. It's things like uh, medical insurance and workman's comp insurance and social security and pensions and um, uh, any number of different insurance policies. Right, right. I think all of that can be provided without a land base. Right. That can be a DAO. That can be distributed around the world and competitive around the world. So I can choose, you know, this company's insurance policy for my medical care and this one for my right, right. social security and this one to provide welfare. Um, I think that we'll be, we'll be so mobile mm -hmm. that uh, being a citizen of one country or another will be less relevant. Uh -huh. And we will, um, by being so mobile, I think taxes will be tied to where you spent each night. Wow. So you would pay just where you spent the night. You know, if I spend 15 days in one place, then 15 over 365 would be how much I would pay that particular So pro rata based on the number of days. Wow. Based on your number of days. Because other, we are very mobile. Correct. And it's being less relevant 
to be a citizen of one place or another. Right. Uh, the I actually feel like we've had um, a a reaction. I think all the politicians understand that, and they're saying, "Oh no, well, you know, we need more tension yeah. <laughs> between countries so that we can." So, you know, we can make ourselves relevant again. Right. But we know, all of us yeah, humans sure. know yes. that the geographic borders are falling. Yeah. And we're opening up and the world's becoming more one big world. Uh, by 2050, I think that's pretty much going to be a certainty. Oh. Oh. Uh, I think in, uh, let's see what other fields I'm thinking about. Oh. I believe that by then we'll probably have um, a fusion energy mm -hmm. and that will be a very clean, very efficient, effective form of energy. I also think we'll probably have um, weather control. Really? And wow. I think that uh, we'll have, uh, whether they're umbrellas in space or, or space stations in space, that are blocking the sun at certain times and opening it up at other times, mm. we're going to be able to control the weather and we're going to have a good sense for, you know, hey, it's getting too hot. Let's, you know, let's move those space stations closer together and block the sun a little bit more. Um, I think in... Uh, I think transportation is going to be amazing because we will um, we'll have the uh, jetpacks or or vertical takeoff and landing drones or whatever, um, but we're also going to be able to fly to you know from here to Tokyo in an hour and a half. Wow! And we'll be able to get to the moon and Mars. Um, they are not that far away. Nice. Uh, and so if you're an entrepreneur, it would be a really good idea to imagine that world because it's already 2024. Your company will probably take 15 years to hit maturity. Right. And, uh, and all I'm talking about is 26 years out. So you you should kind of prepare for a time when geographic borders don't matter that much, when people are flying around in jetpacks, when um, the currency is uh, is all digital and all uh, and and as Bitcoin is, it's perfectly trusted, it's global, it's safe, it's uh, transparent. It um, keeps perfect records. Uh, I, I think that we will have far less need for accounting, auditing, bookkeeping, whatever, because it'll all be done already for us on the blockchain. Wow. This is a fascinating... Okay, you want one more? Yes, please. Okay. This is the blow away. You want a blow away? Yes, sure. Okay. We, we saw an AI company that can um, dig in to your case. Let's say we had a dispute uh -huh. and you wanted to sue. Uh -huh. The AI company can go do all the research and come back to you with, here's your case. Oh. Okay. But then I talked to them and I said, well, can you do it for the opposition? And then they said, of course. So then they can take my defense. They can go and do my defense. And then it's not a big step to say, how's it going to come out? Hmm. And so we, you know, so then we both look at that and we go, okay, we should probably settle. So suddenly all of those legal cases, the huge docket on the judge's desk, that's just like, he's got to go through a hundred of these things. These cases that go on for years and years because the lawyers are paid by the hour right. <laughs> are all going to be less needed. Wow. So I think we got a future that's going to be pretty interesting. Yeah. And you know how the world 
people say, oh God, it's getting worse, getting worse. The world just keeps getting better. And the only thing you have to think about is like, go back a hundred years. Absolutely. You would not want to live here a hundred years ago. Absolutely. No indoor plumbing, no electricity, no internet, no cars, no planes. No heating. Probably just barely making yes. one meal a day. Yes. And now look, it's really starting to take off. We got all sorts of things going on. Project forward another hundred years, they're going to look back and say, God, they were living in the dark ages <laughs> for, you know, for cancer, they had, used to have to cut people open yeah, and yeah. pull it out. Yeah. So many things are going to change. Wow. Yeah. I, I, you, I, mean, I mean, your crystal ball is showing a world which is, which looks really amazing, isn't it? It's like, going to be amazing. Yeah, you see all these drones flying around and <laughs> yeah, I, I, I mean, it, it's Yeah, you'll have to have drones. That you fly in, they'll have bumpers on them so that you could don't bump into but, each other. But they maybe don't need them because the drones know where each other are. So they might navigate. Yeah. yeah. And I've always thought that these self-driving cars, the autonomous cars, are going to be much better right. than the other cars. Do you have and if you, a self-driven car? Um, I've been in one. I've okay. been in the Waymo, which is really amazing. Okay. But what's great about them is if they all know, if there, if no humans are driving, so this would have to be a smart city created in right, a new place. Right. Um, all the cars would know where each other's were. Right. So you could go four hundred miles an hour. Right. Because you you know because potentially you know you're not no danger. Anything. Yes. Yes. And and they could just go <laughs> and get you there. Yeah. Because they knew, you know, oh, we got to do this, we got to do that, and they would avoid each other but still go much, much quicker. And that I think is going to be really interesting. And that's, that's on the ground. That's if you're going on the ground. Yeah. If you're flying, you know, you got a different, you got different set of issues and goals and that kind of thing. So what really is exciting you these days, Tim? Mm. I, I love being here in India and I'm really excited about all these entrepreneurs that you guys are uh, put together for us. Um, that's exciting. I love my show, Meet the Drapers, or yes. our show, Meet the Drapers, which uh, is bringing entrepreneurs from all over the world to a global audience. Yes. Uh, I love our school, Draper University, and right. uh, we've now had about 6,000 people have had hero training. Hero training. Hero training. We've trained about 50,000, but 6,000 have had the real hero training to become real entrepreneurs. And about 1,200 of them have started businesses. And uh, the, the students have come from 102, 103 different countries. Wow, wow. And they've started six unicorns and about 25 companies over 100 million in revenue. So wow. it's really taking off. It's wow. getting to be very, it's working. That's the really wild thing because I did this weird thing and it's working. <laughs> um, and the venture business is going through a major revolution. My, my venture business, I'm using artificial intelligence in about five ways, uh -huh. all sorts of different directions. We do it for deal evaluation, for checking out the industry, for filtering through 250,000 startups for um, uh, checking facts when an entrepreneur is yes. giving us a pitch. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Also watching their facial expression. We have wow. video. We keep, we keep perfect uh, uh, transcriptions of all the interviews we do so that they then um, we can check back. Right, and, and they become and the data even, for your, yeah. We don't even have to check back because it pops up automatically now. Wow. Um, I use it for something on Draper TV. There's something we call Draper Decentralized. I have a, a digital twin. Uh-huh. That... In you a, have a digital twin. I have a digital twin. Okay. An AI twin. And that AI twin... Um, 
presents all sorts of uh, company information, like a talking head in a on a, on the TV. Oh. Um, yeah, you can check it out. It's great fun. Um, we've used. Uh, I also have a digital personality twin that we're working on, so they're going to be able to just answer questions the way I would have. Wow. Wow. So yeah, they're wow. going to be a lot of really interesting. <laughs> There, that so my venture business is going through major transformations, and we're fortunate because we see these things first. We always are the seed investor, so we see them first. So we're way we're years ahead of most of the other venture capitalists in the way we're thinking about using AI. Wow! And because everybody's talking about AI, how much do you think AI will really? create you know disrupt jobs in the sense that people are living today because of lack of complete information or lack of complete access and exposure to the full version of what ai can do everybody says oh ai is going to take away jobs or ai is going to take away for example uh, teachers from classrooms to what extent do you think ai will really change our lives oh, okay two different questions it will change our lives in a big way right our jobs are just going to change. If, you know, the Industrial Revolution, they, they had the same complaint. Right. It's like, oh, I, I'm a, you know, a blacksmith. Blacksmith or a whip manufacturer or whatever. Hmm. And they had to become mechanics and whatever. They rode right, right. cars. Um, I think we've just got to. You know, progress is coming. Right. There are always those people who say, oh, it's going to be horrible. And then they're the ones that say, oh, it was my idea in the first place. You know? <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> the yeah, ones yeah. who are all yeah. terrified yeah. Yeah. now that, oh, we're going to all lose our jobs. Yeah. Everyone is going to lose their job. Every day they're going to lose their job because their new job is the next day. Right. The next day, it's going to be a different job because we got new innovations and we got to adapt to them. We got a new set of customers. We got to keep thinking right. and adapting to that new job that we have every day. Right. Yeah. My son says, "Yeah, of course, AI is going to take all our jobs." Yeah. Of course it is. Hmm. But that doesn't mean we aren't going to have jobs. Right. We'll just have different jobs. Yeah, we'll just be more productive. Right. Right. Fabulous. To end, I'm going to ask you to answer a few questions, one word format. Okay. Some rapid. Okay. Yeah. Uh, of all of all the companies in the world, if you had to choose one company you admire today. Today? Yeah. I would say it's all of Elon's companies. Okay. And why? Um, because he is willing to do whatever it takes mm -hmm. to make those companies successful. And he takes so much heat for it, but he's doing extraordinary things. Mm -hmm. He is really something else. So I would say it's, it's Tesla, SpaceX, and Twitter, and maybe some of his other innovative companies. Wow. Yeah. So obviously, I mean, coming from that, what would you say is his one big quality? You said one that he's willing to take, do whatever it takes. But if one more you had to pick. Yeah, he's an inspirational leader. Mm -hmm. He says, we're going to Mars. Mm -hmm. And then everybody kind of goes, oh, he's kind of crazy. And then the greatest scientists in the world, the greatest engineers in the world all want to join him wow. because they want to be a part of something that's that big. So yes and no answer. He's a big thinker. Big thinker. Yeah. So yes and no answer. Do you have to also be a little crazy to be really inspiringly successful? You have to be willing to go, to be different. Mm -hmm. You got to be willing to step outside of what's currently there. Mm -hmm. You have to be willing to be different from the state of the art of technology, to be different from the people who are all doing it this way. And you've got to always want to improve the lives of the people around you. Wow. So you need to have the guts, you think, to be different? 
the courage or to be the different. Uh, the ambivalence or the whatever. It's got to just skate off your back. Wow. Okay. Uh, to the startup founders listening to you today, uh, Tim, uh, top three qualities they should definitely look to nurture in themselves to be successful? Well, I always flash back to freedom. Uh, think freely. Mm-hmm. Uh, open your mind to possibilities, uh, but the characteristics we look we look for are ambition and drive. That might be one. Uh, passion and intelligence, kind of those two, mm-hmm. flow together for some reason in my mind. Right. And uh, love for their customer. Wow! Wonderful. Beautiful. Lastly, one word for India. One word. Go get them. Okay. <laughs> and one word for Sri Sri University. Oh, I love. Oh, how nice. How nice. Tim, it's delightful for us that you always, you know, you come to our campus. The campus gets filled with uh, 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 an amazing, positive, can-do energy. Oh, come on. It has it all the time. I, I mean, you that's very kind of you, but it increases. <laughs> it increases when you come. Great. So we welcome you again and again. This is your home. Terrific. Thank you so much. Great. Thanks for having me. Thank you.